14 to 18. This is the prologue. Verse 14. And the Lord was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him. That's John the Baptist. And cried, saying, This was he of whom I speak. He cometh, he that cometh after me is preferred before me. For he was before me, speaking of Christ, who is eternal. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. So of grace, folks, we're saved by grace, we're kept by grace, I am and I am by the grace of God. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. May the Lord bless these number of verses to us this evening. The Apostle John, at the beginning of this great book, he leaves out all the wonderful stories and narratives as part regarding the Lord's birth, which we find in Matthew and um, Luke especially. But in return, he tells us the mysterious significance of Christ's birth. He tells us the mysterious significance of Christ's birth. Verse 14 a, that the Lord was made flesh and dwelt among us. The birth of the Lord Jesus in his humanity was very, very unique. When any other person after Adam has been born, it is the creation of a new personality. When a baby's born into this world tonight, we go out and bring out in the hospital, it is the creation of a new personality. We've all different personalities, no one is the same. As a new life has been created which never existed before. But when Jesus was born in his humanity, it was not a creation of a new personality, but a person who had already existed from all eternity. Jesus' birth in his humanity was unique as he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, not by Joseph's seed. He has sinless human nature. The doctrine of the Incarnation down through the generations has always been under serious attack by the skeptics, Gnostics, liberals, false teachers, etc, etc. And what does, at the very beginning of this sermon this evening, what does the Incarnation mean? Incarnation. It basically means, folks, a person who embodies in the flesh a deity. A person who embodies in the flesh a deity. Paul reminds us that God was manifested in the flesh. The supernatural God was manifested in the flesh. And in Christ was all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Express itself. And it expresses itself in the person of the blessed, glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is fully, truly God and fully, truly man. He is the God man. Perfect God and perfect man. He is our wonderful representative and glory as people. He is our great high priest. He is our mediator. He is our advocate. John tells us that Jesus, who is the Word, was made flesh in verse 14 of our passage this evening, which speaks of his incarnation. God, you see, took up residence in a body through Jesus Christ. What a mystery! In which the whole universe can't even contain this God we preach about, 
in which he's revealed himself through his word to us. And yet, he took up residence, he took a body in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus was not a phantom or a, a spirit when he ministered on earth, neither did the Holy Spirit just enter Jesus at baptism and then leave him before his crucifixion, nor was his body a mere illusion. Jesus was truly man as during his ministry, as we go through this Gospel of John in the next number of months in the book, excuse me, in the book of the Lord. During his ministry, his earthly ministry, Jesus was truly man. As John describes that Christ was weary, chapter 4. Christ was thirsty, chapter 4. Christ was hungry. Christ groaned within and wept. On the cross he thirsted. He bled and died after his resurrection. He appeared to his disciples and showed that he still had a real body, which was now his glorified body. So to express this glorious reality of the incarnation, the Apostle John points out its nature, the witnesses on the great impact of the incarnation. So first of all tonight we're going to look at the nature of the incarnation, verse 14, and the word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This very important phrase, when the Word was made flesh, expresses the reality and nature of the Incarnation. John MacArthur states, God took on humanity. The infinite became finite. Eternity entered time. The invisible became visible. The Creator entered His creation in the second person of the Godhead, Jesus Christ. Staggering. What a saviour. Without him, folks, we were absolutely doomed. Without hope. John highlights the word again in verse 14. As he's already mentioned, we've looked at it in the last number of weeks. Verse 1, the word, the word. Three times is mentioned in verse 1. And he mentions it again here in verse 14. Um, what he is saying is that as God's final word to mankind in the person of Jesus Christ, this word Jesus Christ, the second person of the Godhead, he became flesh. He became a human being. This refers to man's physical being, which affirms Jesus' full humanity. As the Hebrew writer it reminds us, but a body has thou preferred me. The eternal Son of God not only became man, but dwelt among mankind for just over 33 years. It says here in our text, verse 14 and 12, He dwelt among us. God didn't leave us in the dark. God came down to us. What grace, what mercy, what love. The chasm was so great that it took an infinite saviour. God is that holy, we are that fallen. It took an infinite saviour to come down and bridge the gap. This word dwelt here in verse 14, dwelt among us, literally means to pitching or living in a tent, etc, etc, as Christ the Lord tabernacled among mankind. Of course when you pitch a tent, you're not there permanently. Christ knew that he was only here for a short period of time. Christ knew this place was not his permanent residence. He tabernacled, you see, among mankind. Especially his own people, the Jews. In the Old Testament, God tented with Israel in the days of Moses 
As he communicated with Moses, what an awesome sight it must have been in the wilderness. God, the Almighty God, communicated with Moses, his servant, in the cloud. As the cloud was above the tabernacle, as God's presence was manifested in the tabernacle during the wilderness wanderings. It tells us in Exodus 40, then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Incidentally, folks, Moses was the only one who could commune with God. Anyone come near that presence, that cloud would have been consumed. And yet, folks, what about we are the people of God? Thank God, this is why we have impact the incarnation is when Jesus Christ came to this world. We are in a better covenant. I will look at this in a few minutes at the end of the sermon. That God's people have access because the way has been consecrated through the blood of Christ. The veil has been rent because of Christ's flesh. He gave his body. He gave his life. He gave his blood as an atonement to redeem us, his people, and himself. And now we can come boldly. We can have fellowship. We can have communion. And that's why I can't emphasize enough, folks, the privilege of the place of prayer. But in Moses' day, it was different. God communicated with Moses in the cloud above the tabernacle in the wilderness and no one else. God also tabernacle present himself in the temple when Solomon, David's son, built the great temple unto the Lord and when Solomon prayed and consecrated it, the Lord appeared in Shekinah glory and as a result, even the priests had to leave the temple and the children of Israel were on their faces. How we long for the presence again of God to come down upon this nation. And of course, the Lord himself revealed himself in some pre-incarnate appearances. There's different examples in the Old Testament especially. The Lord appeared to Abraham just before the went into Sodom to destroy it, the angels, the angels. And he appeared to Moses at the burning bush, and he appeared to Joshua just before they entered the promised land, the one who is the captain of our salvation. And they, these were temporary, you see, tabernacle experiences. Because, folks, this is why the Lord says, build up your treasures for heaven. All us, God's people, we're only pilgrims passing through here. This is not our permanent abode. Our permanent abode, our true home is glory. But the great news is that throughout eternity, which we look forward to being with the Lord forever, God will tabernacle again with his redeemed and glorified people. Revelation 21 tells us, And I heard a good voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. So John is emphasizing here in verse 13, 14 here, And the word Jesus Christ was made flesh, is humanity, and tabernacle dwelt among us, minister. To these apostles ministered to the nation of Israel and ministered to the northern part of Israel, the Gentiles, as he performed that wonderful miracle of feeding 4,000, as well as children, women, and children on top of that. John then goes on to say in verse 14 in relation to Christ's incarnation, the nature of Christ's incarnation, and we beheld his glory. Verse 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, John says. Even though Jesus' earthly life in human flesh manifested God's glory to a certain degree, it was still limited because of his flesh. It was veiled because of his humanity. But the three disciples. The inner circle, in that capacity, 
the three disciples, Peter, James, and John, seeing a manifestation of Christ's heavenly glory at the transfiguration, as his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as light. Also, John, the, the writer of this great, great uh, gospel, John the Apostle, John also, later on, seeing a manifestation of Christ's wonderful glory when he wrote the book of Revelation. When he seen the Lord in blazing glory at the beginning of the book of Revelation, chapter 1, John dropped down as dead. Christ's blazing glory will also be seen when he comes in, cl in the clouds and blazing fire with his holy angels. When every eye will see him in the second coming, there will be no escape. And also in the future and eternity, the fullness of Christ's heavenly glory shall be manifested as being the light of the new Jerusalem, as it will illuminate across the heavenly city in which no sun will be required. John and the disciples, yes, did see the fruit of the Spirit manifest in Christ's earthly life. Jesus displaying God's holy nature with divine attributes such as truth, mercy, wisdom, authority, love, grace, knowledge, power, and holiness, which was beautiful as Jesus glorified his Father. 14 8 says, And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. That was the Lord Jesus' purpose. His main purpose, folks, was to glorify his Father and do the Father's will. The Holy Spirit's office tonight is to glorify Christ. Jesus, you see, revealed God's glory in his words, in his works, the miracles, in his actions. And he revealed the glory as of the only begotten of the Father as he possessed the same nature, you see. This term, begotten, describes that Jesus was unique. The only one of his kind and does not refer to a person's origin. There's only one true Son of God, folks. Begotten, beloved, unique. There's only one source of salvation. And it's through Jesus Christ. John gives us two attributes linked to Jesus Christ. There's many, of course, but he gives us two here in the passage. Jesus Christ, the Lord, which he refers to Jesus of being full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth in verse 14c. Full of grace and truth. Grace and truth, of course, is closely connected with salvation. And the blessed Lord Jesus Christ is the only source of salvation. Peter, when he was arrested with the Sanhedrin as he stood before them with the religious leaders in Jerusalem after preaching that wonderful sermon at Pentecost when around 3,000 were wonderfully converted by the grace of God. But Peter was arrested and he was brought in front of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin is the, the religious council of the Jews or 70 or 71 members of it. And he stood before them and they basically tried to they warned them. And they tried to they said to them, Peter, we do not want you to be speaking in the name of Jesus Christ in this city again. We do not want you to try to stomp them out. We do not want you to be speaking about Jesus of Nazareth. And what did Peter say? Peter hurled out in front of them, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Folks, there's only one way back to God, there's only one source of salvation, and it is receiving God's salvation in Jesus Christ. Have you received him? Have you truly come in humility and brokenness and godly sorrow? Um, repented, finished with your sin, humbly and submitting to the word of God, which we'll look at in a minute, realizing I am a sinner, realizing I have broken God's law. Folks, every person has broken God's law apart from Jesus Christ. 
God's law cannot condemn him, but the law, the deeds of the law, no one is justified because everyone has broken it. This is why we need a saviour, and it's only one saviour, one way of salvation. Jesus is the door. By him, if any man enter in, they shall be saved. He is the source of grace and truth. He is the source of salvation. He is the only one who can deliver you from the powers of darkness and translate you into the kingdom of his glorious Son. John mentions here these attributes referring to Christ full of grace and truth in verse 14 say, Grace, of course, is God's loving, loving kindness and favour bestowed on those who do not deserve it and cannot earn it. Grace is God's loving kindness and favour bestowed on those who do not deserve it and cannot earn it. They're completely bankrupt, no merits within ourselves. This is where many go wrong and err. We go to liberal churches. They think by doing their so-called good works, which is usually in the attitude of pride, of course, they think by doing their good works that they can earn merits with God and earn God's salvation. Such wickedness, high-handed folks, sin, it is an absolute insult to the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus Christ. You see, if we could earn it in our own strength, in our own merits, so we could have peace with God, then why did Jesus Christ have to leave the glory and come into this sin-cursed, evil, corrupt, bent, wicked, evil world? The Bible makes it clear that grace is God's loving kindness and favour bestowed on those who do not deserve it. And it's only bestowed on those who humble themselves. We looked at the sermon this morning about humility. God resists the proud. Folks, the majority who end up in hell is because of pride. They're not willing to submit to God's word. You must be born again. It's easiest for by grace you're saved. Through faith, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Of course, if God dealt with us according just for the law, the truth, as it says, he's full of grace and truth. If God dealt with us just according to the truth of the scriptures, the law of God, none of us could meet the requirements. We all fall, fall desperately short and are guilty before a holy God as we have violated his perfect holy law. But praise God, who delighteth in mercy, God deals with us on the basis of grace and truth, who is found in his glorious Son, the blessed Lord Jesus Christ. His righteousness has been imputed to our account, and by his righteousness and power, which has been imparted to us, that then we can fulfill the law by his grace. Verse 14, it says that he's full of grace and truth. Verse 17, B, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. There's no saving grace or salvation except those who believe in the truth of God's word, submitting to God's word. Who points us, of course, the truth of God's word points us to Jesus Christ. For he is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Have you humbled yourself? Have you submitted? Have you come God's way in the person of Jesus Christ? The Lord Jesus Christ is the full expression of God's grace. And the full expression of God's truth. People can talk about God and their vain imaginations, but the try to leave Jesus Christ out of the equation, when you bring the Lord's name into the Lord Jesus Christ, they start getting uncomfortable. People have many gods across this world tonight, 
in their vain imaginations. But the only source, the only way to make your peace with the living God, the only way to be reconciled to the living God is through the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no other way. Yes, in the Old Testament, Christ was only partially revealed through prophecy, types, pictures, etc., with some clarity. But in the last days, God has spoken to us through His Son. It is transparent. Man is without an excuse who expresses God's grace and truth. It is no good just knowing the facts about Jesus Christ. That will not save you. But you must put in the facts and the practice by submitting in humility to his word and truth. Receiving, receiving grace in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, you must put the facts in action. You see, folks, the Bible speaks of the word in Christ is throughout the New Testament. On the experience of saving grace in Jesus Christ, you must be in Jesus Christ. You must be in that living, personal, dynamic relationship with Jesus Christ. You must be connected, attached, linked to Jesus Christ. You must be in union with Jesus Christ. He is your federal head, Lordship. He is the true vine, you're the branch. Are you connected tonight? The Lord gives a great test to show the genuine believer who has submitted to his word, truth, and received salvation, saving grace. John 8, again this book of John is incredible. Lord, there's many following him, and yet the Lord knew they were just after the miracles, what they could get out of it. And the Lord knew that there was many phony professing believers, but they were not true believers in him. And the Lord gave this test to show who is a genuine believer from the false. Jesus says, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You see, folks, it's all about the word. Truth. Grace. There's no point in the facts about the Bible. You need to put them into practice. So we've discovered the nature of the incarnation. Christ became flesh. Truly, fully God. Truly, fully man. And he dwelt among us. He tabernacled among us. And he glorified his Father who is the one who is full of grace and truth. Have you received saving grace tonight? Have you truly come God's way through Jesus Christ, repented and believed the gospel? Folks, are you in Christ? Are you connected? Are you linked? Are you attached? Are you in union with Jesus Christ? Is he your Lord, Saviour, Redeemer, King, the captain of your salvation? Very quickly as we move on here, secondly, we have the witnesses of the incarnation. The witnesses of the incarnation, verse 15. John bore witness of him, speaking of John the Baptist here, and cried, saying, This was he of whom I speak. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. The witnesses of the incarnation. To reinforce this truth in relation to the divine, pre-existent, incarnate word, the blessed Lord Jesus Christ, the Apostle John explains about different witnesses which included John the Baptist. Verse 15, eh, John bore witness of him. There was no greater cure to the, the womb. Luke tells us what a testimony John the Baptist had. He says that, that John was great in the sight of the Lord. And also here in this text, it talks about in verse 16, the testimony of believers, including himself, John the Apostle. 
The Apostle John explains that John the Baptist identified the Lord Jesus Christ in his person, verse 15a. John bore witness of him. And also he identifies the Lord Jesus Christ in verse 15. His preeminence, verse 15b. He that cometh after me is preferred before me. And also John expresses, identifies the Lord Jesus Christ in his person as his pre-existence. He is eternal. Verse 15 C. For he was before me. His person. His preeminence. His pre-existence. He is the eternal one. Jesus was born in his humanity six months later. After John the Baptist. And began his public ministry after John the Baptist as well. But John was the forerunner who heard in the promised Messiah. It says in verse 15 a, John bore witness of him and cried. He hurled. That's what we're meant to do, folks, is hurl the gospel out. Preach with conviction. John the Baptist certainly was not shallow when he was speaking. He hurled the gospel out. Preached repentance. Calling the people to repent, finish with your sin, calling them to repent and prepare themselves for the promised Messiah, which the prophets spoke about, his arrival, as John knew Christ must increase and he himself decrease. 15 me, he that cometh after me is preferred before me. I wonder tonight in your Christian experience, Christian walk, is the Lord increasing and you are decreasing? Are you walking in the spirit or are you giving position to the flesh? Many struggle, so to say, in their Christian walk because, folks, the times are flashing. They're double minded instead of being single legged. But this man, John the Baptist, certainly, he was vertical towards heaven. He was faithful. He was great in the sight of the Lord. Jesus says, There's no greater that came out of the womb. And what a privilege he had to prepare the way of the Messiah. He was the forerunner. And he fulfilled his ministry right to the ladder. He fulfilled his calling, which cost him his life being beheaded. But John knew that Christ must increase and he decrease. Then in verse 16, John included himself the testimony of all believers have received his fullness as all our sufficiency is in him. We're complete in him, folks, with all spiritual blessings and heavenly graces in Christ Jesus. We're complete as he gives us grace upon grace, as his grace is inexhaustible, as his, as his grace is unlimited, as, as it is sufficient for all things, all tasks, all ministries, and all situations, as Paul reminds us that he is, I am that I am by the grace of God, verse 16 it tells him, of his fullness have all we received, grace for grace, all our sufficiency, folks, is in Christ. And yet why there's many people profess salvation on the turn of these so-called Christian counselors or whatever else. Folks, our counselor is Jesus Christ. Oh, turn to his word. Submit the situation to him. Submit the circumstances to him. He is sovereign over all things. Leave it with him. Plead the word with him. You see, his grace is sufficient for every situation. Grace, for grace, verse 16 tells us. So we've discovered the nature and the witness of the Incarnation. Very quickly, as I conclude here tonight, finally as we close. Thirdly, we have the impact, the impact, the better covenant because of the Incarnation. Verse 17 and 18. For the law was given by no Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man has seen God any time, the only begotten Son. 
which is at the bosom of the Father, he God to clear him. The impact because of the incarnation. Obviously, the impact was huge, it was monumental. As grace triumphed over the law. The law, of course, is holy. The law is righteous. The law is good. It's penned by God's great prophet Moses, verse 17 a. For the law was given by Moses. But sadly, the Jews twisted the law because of their conditions. They added 613 extra laws unto the law. And even Jesus rebuked them and said, You made the word of God known of fact because of your tradition. But the law, you see, was not an instrument of grace and could not provide salvation and save anyone, but could only condemn, showing us we all have broken it. We are guilty before a holy God, which was our schoolmaster, the law, that we needed a saviour. It was to drive us to the saviour. Verse 17 b but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus praised his glorious name because of what he accomplished on the cross of Calvary and his resurrection. The Lord Jesus has ushered in a bad covenant. The new and living way, the covenant of grace. Folks, we are the most privileged people on earth. We're under the covenant of grace. For God sent not a son to the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The Lord has taken a people out of this world, Jew and Gentile, and bringing them into the body of Christ. Hallelujah, he's called us according to his purpose. What an impact the incarnation of Christ is as he has ushered in the new covenant, the better covenant. The law, you see, is holy. The law is perfect. But it can only condemn us. That's why it took grace and truth through Jesus Christ. All God's true redeemed people have been baptized by the Holy Spirit as the Spirit lives, dwells, resides, abides within us as Paul reminds us that the Spirit of God witnesses with our Spirit that we are the children of God and if you have not the Spirit of Christ you are none of us. The Spirit of God, folks, leads us, directs us, inspires us, gives us a desire for the Word of God gives us a desire for, for the things of God. The Holy Spirit convicts us. The Holy Spirit sanctifies us. The Holy Spirit enables us. The Holy Spirit energizes us, quickens us. The Holy Spirit reveals Christ more and more to us. What a covenant. Why am I mentioning that? Why am I talking about the Holy Spirit here because of this new covenant? Because folks in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, the Holy Spirit came upon people for service to accomplish the will of God, but He didn't abide within them. What an impact the incarnation through Jesus Christ, what He accomplished, has, has had. Another massive impact of the incarnation result of Christ's ministry was to testify and glorify his Father in heaven. Verse 18 has include, No man has seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is the version of the Father, he have declared him. He have declared him. Jesus Christ declared God to us. It is through Jesus Christ that the image of the invisible God is revealed. Jesus said to Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. God cannot be known unless he reveals himself. And Jesus is the revelation, explanation of God. Verse 18b says, he have declared him. He have declared him. This word declared, explain. Jesus declared, explain God to mankind. What does it mean, declared? Well, it basically means, folks, exegesis in the Greek. Jesus explained exegesis, which is the proper.
proper method, practice of interpreting scripture. The blessed Lord Jesus Christ, the only unique begotten one, is the only one qualified to exegete or interpret God the man, since, since uh, no one knows the, the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, as the Lord Jesus is God manifested in the flesh. Jesus executed, Jesus interpreted, Jesus declared, Jesus explained God to mankind. His main purpose, you see, was, was to glorify his Father in heaven, explain God to the nation of Israel. So this opening prologue, these 18 verses, which we've studied over the last month or so, this open prologue of John highlights that Jesus is eternally God, verse 1. That Jesus is the creator of God, verse 3. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. That Jesus is the life and the light, verse 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. There's no other way of salvation for him, folks. That Jesus became flesh, he looked up the Satan, and the Word was made flesh. That Jesus brought the full expression of grace and truth to mankind, verse 14 and 17. And also Jesus revealed, he executed, he revealed, he expressed, he declared, he explained God, revealed God to man, verse 18. In which we will discover in the remainder of John's Gospel. And the will of the Lord over the next number of months, this great book of these wonderful truths of Jesus Christ. John's purpose, folks, was to tone around and enforce with great glory that Jesus Christ is truly God and truly man. The challenge is what think you of Christ tonight? What think you of Christ? Are you saved? Are you born of God? And the determined folks is a serious thing. What think you of Christ? He is the only source of salvation. He is the only one who can give you peace, reconcile you to the living God. What think you of Christ, the one who is full of grace and truth? Have you submitted to the claims of Christ? You must be born again. Be wise. Flee from the wrath to come. Because there's no other alternative. If you reject and die in your sin, you'll perish in the lake of fire for eternity. But praise God, folks. Christ is full of grace and truth. There's provision in Jesus Christ. Flee. Come. Cry on them for mercy. If the Lord is speaking, deal with you. This evening. The Lord bless these few words to us. We'll conclude our meeting tonight by singing hymn number 283. 283, thanks for your patience. 283. Come, you sinners lost and hopeless. Jesus, God, can make you free. For he saved the worst among you when he saved the rest like me. Verse 3, in temptation he is nearly, holds the power of hell at bay, guides you through the path of safety, gives you grace, there you go, there's grace again, gives you grace for every day. This wonderful Saviour is full of grace and truth, and his grace is sufficient for his people in all situations. We'll stand please as we conclude our meeting.